Lady Golf Club. And I'd like to start the proceedings by calling um, Councillor Blakely, please. You've got five minutes, Chris. Thank you, Chairman. Right, I've got to go through the, the process I've just been about. So you sit down, Chris. Okay. First of all, have we got any apologies? No, thank you. Members code of conduct. Has anybody, has any member got any declarations of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? David? Well, I'm saying I'm failing with you. Personal and non-pecuniary interest, as I am a council nominated trustee of the West Kirby charity, which owns two parcels of land in the area of the Gulf of War. It's non-pecuniary in the sense that I'm not financially involved. Thanks.
stated they had a state as capital of £1,000, which does not seem very much considering they are to be funding a multi million pound investment for golf resort. One of the directors has 75% shares in the company, is also listed as being director of 18, okay, 18 previous companies. Many are now resolved. One of them, Carl's Construction, went into liquidation. And this is a com company that built Penta Nicholas Luxury Homes. So one has to ask, Chairman, with, with that sort of person, or that sort of listing in the company's house, with that sort of pedigree, should the council really be getting into bed with, with a company that, at best on that description, can be described as a little bit risky? You know, I, I'm not going to go further than that, but I would say it's a little bit of a risk. If, if you read that, if you were making an investment and you read that on company's house, would you think twice about putting that sort of money in? Am I going to get value for money? Will it come out right? I don't know. Chairman, I'll leave it at that point because I don't want to overstay my welcome or go over over on the time. So I'll happily leave it at that point, listen to what other people have to say because I know that I do know I can sum up later on. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and thanks for sticking within the five minutes. Thank you. Pleasure, are there any members of the committee who would like to ask Chris oh, any, just before you go? Yeah. Are there any questions anybody would like to ask? Thank you, Chair. Um, could I just ask? Whether in fact you were aware during your deliberations of that company and doing obviously the due diligence that you would expect the council to have entertained, were any of the people involved in this ever bankrupt or? Uh, I, 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 I couldn't find out this at all. I tell you what, what I've been able to find. But there will be instruments where you can take that sort of information, I'm sure, but I'm, you know, just, just at the top, that's all you need. Schools, 
a new access link road and off-site road improvements, quality housing as an enabling development, and environmental enhancements and treatments of a former landfill site. The, the, the developer is uh, Nicholas Street Venture Group, one of the world's leading golf organisations, and re recently Celtic Manor have also expressed interest in being part of this project. Um, the cabinet report sought uh, approval to sign the development agreement and the, the fees that have been referred to um, earlier on. And this uh, is required uh, prior to a funding strategy being submitted to cabinet in the new year. If I can address myself particularly to the um, reasons for the call, uh, which uh, has been signed by most of the Conservative group, but interestingly not the leader of the Conservative group, so I'm not sure where he stands on this. But anyway, nevertheless, um, the, one of the, the first arguments is that the signatories claim that uh, by agreeing to the framework development agreement, the council is committing to a quote, done deal. Um, I believe that's not correct. Paragraph 7.1 of the report makes it clear that the council, quote, the council retains at its absolute discretion the ability to withdraw from the project should the funding strategy not prove to be acceptable to the council, unquote. So in other words, Chair, this is a process, this is a journey, this is the first stage of the process. We're not committing to uh, the whole doom the whole project until we're convinced that there is a funding plan in place which is credible, and that will come back to Cabinet uh, probably in about March of next year. There will be another opportunity for members to debate that. The signatories uh, say that the court, mm -hmm. the court and the disappointed project has not been subject to full debate by council, and uh, uh, so that other issues such as traffic impact, wildlife, flora and fauna, etc., can be fully explored, and the impact on the green belt. All of these issues, Chair, will be uh, dealt with um, as part of the planning process, which we, we, we're all familiar with. So I, I don't believe that that is a, um, a, a fundamental flaw. Um, the third uh, issue the signatories raise is that they believe that the signing of the uh, Framework Development agree Agreement ren renders any further consultation as meaningless. I, I, I reject that. As I said earlier on, this is the uh, first stage of the process. There has been some informal consultation with residents back in last year. There will be further consultation, um, both informally and informally as part of the consultation process. The, a lot of the signatories then go on to obviously raise the issue of the uh, 595,000 um, which the, the Cabinet report recommended. I accept that this is a um, significant amount of money, but my um, argument to the committee is the prize at the stake is absolutely enormous. And 595,000 actually represents only 0.3% of the total um, potential project costs uh, of £190 million pounds of benefits uh, of this project. Um, so I believe that, I accept that there is an element of risk, but I think the risk at the moment from the uh, information I've been given is a calculated one um, in terms of potential benefits, in terms of jobs, investment, and, and creating um, a really world-class facility. So in closing, um, Chair, my argument is projects like this show, show our ambition for work. Um, we need, don't we, we know that we need um, to generate more council tax, we need receipts from housing, we need to generate more business rates from creating more businesses because we know that our main government grant is being completely withdrawn. So by 2020, we'll only have those two sources of income plus fees and charges to deliver public services. My argument is this project delivers the economic benefits, but it also delivers the vital funding for us to provide decent public services for this local authority going forward. In conclusion, I believe we should be ambitious. I believe uh, we are in, in, in a process. This is the first stage. There will be plenty of other opportunities particularly when the funding uh, strategy comes back in March, for us to take a view. But I believe, as leader of the Council, we should be ambitious uh, for the world, and I think this is a um, project that is, is at, this, at this stage, worthy of support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bill. Can you just, can you just hang on for yeah. any questions? Any questions, I'll take Chris, Chris Riggs first. Okay, well, the, um, the, the, the 
estimate is 170 direct jobs. Uh, we will have, obviously, um, construction jobs to actually build the, the, the scheme. Um, but there'll be a, um, a new golf um, facility, clubhouse, a new four-star hotel um, with restaurants, etc. Uh, so that will generate those direct jobs. But there's also the supply chain on, on the back of that that, that um, will service all of that. And of course, I, I genuinely believe, and I have spoken to the people from Celtic Manor, and if anybody has taken any time to look at what they do at Celtic Manor, it is absolutely fantastic. The thing about the importance, why I believe that Celtic Manor is a game changer for this project, is, is only 10% of Celtic Manor's income is from golf. Um, the vast majority of income is from the people staying at the hotel, people eating in the restaurant, um, people just visiting the area, and I, I believe that the additional jobs that will be created, not just on the back of having a, a fantastic golf facility, but just generating a, a destination, an international destination, that will attract visitors and tourists, not just to Hoyle, but to the whole of the world. Uh, those are the kind of jobs that I think we are desperately in need of. David. So actually, the, the, why I think the Celtic Manor thing is a game changer is it means that the, the golf offer is not the only um, income stream that this project will be uh, dependent on. It will have, um, uh, hopefully Celtic Manor um, are the, the operator, it will have a whole series of other offers to tempt visitors, tourists, etc. So I don't believe that, that whether golf is or, or isn't popular, I don't believe that that is, is, is fundamental to the success of the scheme. I think there are other um, attractions that can be built into the project that will generate um, um, visitors um, to, to the, the site. And, you know, um, I think uh, anybody who, who has seen the, the interest uh, generated, obviously, in Hoylake from the Open will know that, that, um, that, that there's a whole series of ancillary um, companies, businesses, so uh, I don't think we're necessarily putting all our eggs in the golf basket. I mean, mix my my metaphors. <laughs> uh, what happens if the if the uh, deal doesn't go ahead? Now I, I absolutely accept that um, you know this is ultimately you know the planning committee will will need to make a, a, a decision on this. 
Um, what the, the, the funding agreement, and David Ball's um, obviously going to follow, follow me later on, um, but I think I believe there needs to be um, something built into the funding agreement, which is the next stage in this process, which will come back to Cabinet in, a, I think, about March of next year. We'll need to have certain conditions attached to it, and I think that, that will be one of them. But I'll let David explain more of the technical details around what we can build into the funding agreement if. So, and the, and the revenue support grant being completely and utterly withdrawn, the main funding block that we've historically relied on, um, social care in crisis, going through the roof, etc., etc. So we are in a, a, a situation that certainly in my um, lifetime as a councillor, um, uh, I have not experienced before. We desperately need to identify now those sources of income that will actually ensure that we deliver good public services, decent public services yeah. for the people who are all going forward. So projects like this, that I think will be economically beneficial anyway, <coughs> will generate those vital additional housing receipts, council tax receipts, those business rates. But frankly, if we don't have going forward, I worry that we may not even be able to deliver our statutory services going forward. That's right. Before I call just reiterate, these are questions to the Leader of the Council. Jean, as eloquent as she was, made a statement. She actually didn't ask a question. And that will come at the end when we debate the merits and the demerits of this calling. So please, I'd ask the committee to keep it to questions only at this stage. Thank you.
job in, in the hotel, in Hoylake and what have you. Maybe the end destination is a job somewhere else, but the skills they've gained as an intermediate apprenticeship uh, would give them the opportunity, well, would give them the, the credibility and the em employment um, right in the market, really, to, to sell that elsewhere, you know, made in world, if you like. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. I, I believe projects like this, um, and again, um, uh, David, who's following me, um, will, I'm sure, give you the kind of technical Potentially, the direct and indirect jobs from this could be massive in the hospitality sector if we're literally bringing thousands of additional visitors into Europe every year. Um, you know, uh, so we've got to do that. And then obviously we've just opened on rural waters a new construction college uh, where we're teaching our young people uh, construction trades. So building this is, is a tailor-made opportunity for all those young people who are currently learning various trades in that fantastic facility, if anybody who's not been around it, I really recommend going around it. You know, to um, to get those jobs to, to actually build this uh, this project. So I absolutely agree. I think you know, again, as well as the the, the, the vital additional income it will generate for the council, it gives us the opportunity to to deal with um, the the issue of the challenge about how we create pathways into work for our young people. So I'm, I absolutely agree with that. Review 
of all of our alleged services in the London, primarily because we are subsidising to the tune of £4 million pounds at the moment our leisure uh, services in entirety. Uh, so there needs to be, I think, uh, a review to look at how we can get better value for money and maximise the, the rural pounds. So, you know, um, I think I think we may make some changes, but we need to let the review that uh, is taking place take its course. But just to repeat, Chair, um, this, this, the, the uh, attraction of this scheme is not solely reliant on golf. Um, you know, I, I would really urge you to look at the Celtic Manor model because they have, have maximised other um, opportunities for bringing visitors um, in and tourists in, which is not wholly dependent on golf. Uh, so I, I do believe that there is a, there is a wider offer here, um, as I say, that, that is not golf dependent. Although I think, you know, I think it will enhance. And of course, the other, the other thing is it's providing us with a new municipal uh, golf course in, in Boyleth, which I, I think is a, an added, and it'll be the first time Jack Nicholas Jack Nicholas Group have done any municipal golf course, and I think that's good news for, for, for people who enjoy um, using the, the current municipal courts at Hull. Thanks, Chair. Before I bring you in, and John, can I just remind the, the members of the public, please, I will not tolerate people shouting out, I will ask you to leave. So please give some respect to the, to the people who are here so we can allow everybody to speak. I've always so, thought that that was I'm not asking for a comment, sir. Please be quiet. And I would ask all the, all the members of the public to be the same and to show the same respect. Thank you. John. Thank you, John. Um, I want to refer to a
we need to see what the funding uh, assessment says when it comes back in March. Um, uh, there may be there may be a requirement um, for some sort of funding, but I don't know at this stage. But just to reiterate, this we're not agreeing the whole thing today. This is in order to get to the next stage, which is the funding agreement. And I think by March of next year, members um, will be in a much better position to see um, the, um, uh, the, the, the risks and the rewards of the whole scheme. But this is in order to get us to that point next March when we've got a, a much more fully worked up uh, funding agreement. And there will be conditions attached to that, uh, again, which we will need to be satisfied with. And I repeat, Chair, that saying yes to the framework development agreement does not mean that we are locked in forever in a day. Um, we will have an opportunity in March of next year, uh, and it says it in paragraph 7.1 of, of this um, report, um, we have absolute discretion to withdraw from the project should the funding strategy not true prove to be acceptable. So I think the answer to your question is um, we'll know more when that strategy is in place. But this is absolutely, uh, just to, to, to finish the point, this is absolutely not a done deal, um, but this is a necessary step uh, to get us to the next stage. Yeah. And just want to be very clear on that question, because it is a bit of a case with my eye had from the table for the longest point. Uh, it says uh, the council has absolute discretion to withdraw from the scheme should the funding strategy not be acceptable. Now, the funding agreement, according to this notice to me, will be signed by the end of December. Now, is it then that we have to either agree or withdraw, or is it at the end of the three months thereafter, at March? Uh, because I would certainly be happier if it was at March, uh, because that, that then ends the matter, or the thing is then going forward and we know where we start. Okay, Chair, sure, my understanding is that David is charge of the detail of this. My, my understanding is the funding agreement will come back to Cabinet in around about March of next year and that will be at the point at which we, we can say yay or no. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that's, you're happy with that, John, because I think that was a very clear and concise and may I say very honest answer from the Leader of the Council at this stage. Um, David. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, continuing on from the panel that have just been made to that question, uh, to John, and reports itself on page 29, which is uh, 5.6, and the comments in there are that uh, both parties agree to the funding... Sorry, Chair, is this the confidential agreement? This is a confidential agreement, we can't discuss in public. Hang on then, please. Hang on, David. Well, I, 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 no, I, David, hang on. I apologise then, because what I will do is I'll ask that question later on, because it is fundamental. Yes, we may, we may well need to ask the general public to leave. Can, can, okay. I, can so, I then revert back to my first question, which was um, very eloquently addressed the point about creating employment and jobs and bringing revenue into the community. Once the development is, is completed, what sort of revenue and funding will the council look to be seen from that? On a year and annual basis, compared to, say, the school playing field in my ward, which will generate over half a million pounds of the council. Well, okay, I can give you some information on that, but again, I would urge you to ask David to be on details. My understanding is on, on um, uh, the annual revenue to the council from business rates, that would be somewhere in the region of £315,000 per annum, and on council tax, somewhere in the region of be about 4.5 million over five years. There will be a capital receipt for the sale of the land um, uh, if that is, is, is concluded. And we'll also get what's called an overage, which is basically a share of the profits from the operation of the hotel and the facilities on the site. So that, those, those are the financial returns of the council.
Lemon Peninsula, not on the main route to anywhere, will actually generate the same in our Gulf of England? Well, all, all I can say to that, Geoffrey, is that when the Chief Exec and the Chief Operating Officer of Celtic Manor came up to speak to us, um, they said that this, this is the first opportunity outside um, uh, the, their own de uh, development in, in Newport that they feel is, is uh, so attractive that they want to manage the, the facility. What we've got that Celtic Manor hasn't got is wonderful beaches and wonderful countryside. Uh, anybody who knows the area around Celtic Manor will know it, it, it is not a patch on Boy Lake and West Kirby. So they are so excited about the opportunities that they believe uh, that, that will be uh, created by this development that this is the first um, project outside uh, the home area that they've, they've said yes to and they, they, you know, they've had lots of approaches from parts of the country. So, you know, they are a serious player and I take what they say seriously as well. Just on a slightly different area, um, I think you said Tony has already 